So when people ask me who I am, I usually tell them that I'm a former athlete, gone entrepreneur, who also does a bit of TV. Interesting, they say. What a weird combo. How did that happen? And I reply, I'll tell you, and maybe you can draw some conclusions from my story. Whoopa. Is that the right one? Yeah. I'm born and raised in Sweden in the 80s by Polish parents. And I was pretty much the only one from everybody that I knew who had a weird foreign, hard to spell, and even harder to pronounce last name. So this was the story of my childhood. K, K, O, K, what now? In the context when you just want to belong, I would sit as the, the one child at uh, the first day of school when the teacher would call all children's names and they would get stuck on mine couldn't pronounce it, and all children would turn around and stare, who is that different person? And I would sit in the back, say, yes, I'm here. And from that grew a very strong, almost subconscious will not to ever have to legitimize or explain my presence again. And as there were no pistachios available, I chose a different tactic. I became a proper alpha kid. And by that, I mean I would become the best in class. I would ace all tests all the time. I would go to music school, blah, blah, blah. I was probably super obnoxious. And this became me. High performing and ambitious, slightly pretentious, perhaps. I mean, how many 13-year-olds attempt as Dostoevsky? <laughs> I never really reflected on what motivation was for me. This was my way. The years went by, and my choice of higher studies went accordingly. Uh, when finishing high school and planning for college, everybody said, and by everybody, I mean not least my Polish mother, that business is good, a prestigious education is good, and the way to go. And me, just following my given path, said, okay, what is the absolutely hardest school to get into in Sweden at the time? That would be Stockholm School of Economics. Done. That's where I applied and that's where I enrolled. So there I was in Sweden's by far most renowned uh, school when it comes to finance, uh, management and marketing. And it was hard. They were stuffing us with so much theory and I would do my best to keep up. Everybody was super smart. Uh, and in a couple of years, I'd, I'd become a young adult. And for the first time in my life, I had started to think for myself a little bit more. And with that came a second guessing of my chosen path in life. Maybe, after all, I wasn't meant to go to London to work super long hours in a bank and never have any time to have fun. But if not, what was I to do? Like, this was everything that I had known, and I just followed the, the given trail at the school. And I started to feel uh, like an outsider again, which was everything that I didn't want to feel. And I started lacking motivation to study that hard. So I decided to give myself some time off to think. And this was right about the time when that movie The Beach had opened in cinemas. And for the younger crowd here, uh, it's uh, a movie about a young Leonardo DiCaprio and his various mischiefs on a uh, completely unexploited Thai island. So clearly it's an old movie. And anyhow, from that, I had the super original idea, I thought at the time. Let's go backpacking. Very original. Uh, that would be me and about 100,000 other youngsters at the time. Anyhow, I took the time off and flew across the globe, so there I found myself, in Bangkok. Fine. Uh, and after a couple of weeks of sipping pineapple shakes, you can only drink so many, I started to feel bored, like I need for something to happen. And a fellow traveler tipped me off, you know, Magda, there's this really cool Muay Thai camp in the north of Thailand, in Chiang Mai. And I figured, sure, why not? I'm heading there any anyway, so let's go check that thing out. 
And I went, and here's what I saw coming from this super narrow world. And just on a side note, what's interesting about the, the backpacking community is that there are no preconceived notions about people's identities. Because everyone wears more or less the same uniform. It's shorts and a washed out t-shirt. So you can never tell by the way somebody dresses whether you're talking to a marketing executive or a construction worker. So there I was. And what I see is I'm completely in the, in the nowhere next to a pig farm. And there's a, a, a ring where some guys are sparring. Uh, there's a tin roof under which other guys are uh, punching bags. There's a super rusty uh, weightlifting gym in the back and there are some other guys skipping ropes. So it was about as cool as that guy had said, especially for me coming from this super narrow homogenous world. And uh, I said to them, hello, I would like to join whatever it is you're doing here. And to give you the framework, in Thailand, uh, it's not like putting, uh, like us Westerners putting our kids to football school because it's fun. For the Thais, uh, fighting is a way of potentially supporting yourself. So they put kids, as soon as they can walk, they put them in front of a bag and the, the kids grow up to fight and to support themselves and their family and possibly their camp. So there comes that white chick saying she wants in. And the Thais being a very polite people, would never be rude directly to your face. So they gave me a smiling uh, message to read between the lines by simply ignoring me. Thank you, but no thank you. Uh, but that just made it all the more interesting. So I persisted. I would go back there every day, standing next to the boxers because they all ignored me, and I would try and imitate whatever it is they're doing. I would try and punch and elbow the bags, and my knuckles were bloody. I had no clue what I was doing. But after six or seven days, a trainer who had seen that persistent white lady make a fool of herself said, okay, come, I show you. And he held uh, pads for me, like the ones we train on to kick and um, punch on in what was probably the shortest round in the history of boxing ever. But those few seconds were enough for me to fall madly in love. I had never previously been so exhausted yet felt so alive at the same time. And I just knew, oh my God, I have to have this feeling again. I went back home eventually resumed my studies, but I had found my new and true identity, at least for the following uh, decade. I became a fighter with everything that that entails of direction and goal in life. And this was not what a Caucasian female middle class uh, business school student was supposed to do, but that just made it all the more interesting. And above all, it was what made me happy. It was what I wanted to do. It felt right. And in Thai boxing, there are really no uh, ways of climbing in rank or earning belts in different colors or degrees. You just have a record. You fight or you don't. And if you're in the ring, you either win or you lose. And there's your record. So I eventually started measuring my skills against others in the ring and all of a sudden I found myself on the national team. And after winning the world championships in Bangkok six years later, I was also, uh, I also became the second female professional fighter in Sweden ever. I got to share the stage, or more accurately, the ring, with my greatest idols at the, t at the time. So I was about as successful as one can be within this identity. Yay! Nice memory still. Anyhow, there comes a point, or at least in my case, there came a point when I wasn't hungry anymore. When my uh, fear of losing and not maintaining my relationship uh, or my status and my reputation became bigger than the will to win. 
And also, my body started breaking and deteriorating bit by bit, so I had to retire for various reasons. And then followed a void, a period of emptiness, when I didn't know who I was. Who was I if I was not, was not a fighter? Everything that I had taken for granted and the whole meaning of everything that, you know, that I was headed for and aiming for was no longer there. So I didn't know who I was. And I'm not gonna lie, it was, it was tough. Um, while fighting though, I had continued my studies. I had graduated uh, my master's degree and I had simultaneously started to work uh, within the advertising agency as an account director, like a real grown-up. And that was all good, I suppose, but it wasn't really enough for me. I felt there was something missing. And then I got a call from a casting agent because of my reputation as a fighter uh, from the production company that was going to revive one of Sweden's biggest TV formats of all time, which is uh, the Swedish edition of American Gladiators. And I got a new role to play. <laughs> Gladiator Athena is loosely based on my personality, uh, slightly less clothed, uh, but also very, you know, skewed and twisted for fun and entertainment. But this worked pretty well as a substitute for the fighter person, because we do compete. Uh, we throw people off bridges and stuff. And, uh, it, well, and it was for sure not something that a former elite badass female fighter, nor an account director at an ad agency was supposed to do. But honestly, that just made it all the more interesting. And I did this for uh, six years, and then I was cast from a, uh, another TV channel as a um, financial expert on a show that is loosely translated as the luxury trap. It's about uh, normal people who find themselves in financial difficulties. So me and my co-host try and help them, both in terms of urgent you know, monetary issues that need to be resolved, but also um, longer term to coach them into smarter life decisions overall. Uh, yeah, it's real and we tape really, really late. And you know what? This is in fact what a business school graduate, uh, former athlete and a TV strong person is supposed to do. For me, it's the perfect fusion or outcome, if you will, of my previous identities. And today, I enjoy doing this. For me, it's right. And I think that most of us make a little identity journey, or will do, before we land in the right one. The road might be uh, scary and unknown sometimes, but I think that the trick is to not pay too much attention to what the norms and expectations of society are, what people around us say is or isn't right for you. So in fact, to succeed long term, act short term by listening to your gut. But I realize that saying listen to your gut or follow your heart, blah, 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 might sound a bit too new age for some. So I thought I'll explain this to you in slightly more academic terms instead. With a graph that I've made on the optimal way of achieving success in life. And here's how it goes. On the x-axis is our own personal success factors that we strive for. And these can be anything from money in the bank, diplomas, titles, any achievement really. And on the y-axis is our perceived cost as a function for, for this or from this uh, desired success. So that is energy, time spent, sacrifices that we have to make. And the connection there between is pretty linear. The greater the success, the more we have to pay, the bigger the effort, right? And being a reasonably smart person I will want to maximize my success. I will want to have as much sense of fulfillment as I possibly can and be happy while striving to lower my perceived cost. I don't want to struggle so much for what I want to achieve. 
in terms of here. I want to maximize my x value while lowering the y value. That is, I want to decrease the incline of the line. And how do I do that? The key is, in bright in your face pink, motivation. Your internal true motivation, wanting something with your gut and your heart, not just for the head and for the intellect, and not because it's what's expected from you, from others. In terms of today's topic, an enforced and adapted identity to please others is not the way for success. To embark on a project or a career path, I'm happy that people are taping. <laughs> uh, because it's what others are expecting from you, or it's because it's you know, what, what would look good on your CV, is less likely to uh, allow for great success because your perceived cost will be so much higher and you'll struggle so much more when you're not internally motivated enough. In my country, Sweden, Official data says that over 30% of the working population are unhappy with their career choice and with their everyday work life. Imagine the inefficiency and underperformance in so many companies. The rational and socio-economically optimal thing to do is for every individual to choose for themselves. So we must encourage each other and our children to look yourselves in the mirror and choose a life, projects, careers, whatnot, for that person and for that person only. If it doesn't feel right in your gut, move on until it does. That is the optimal way to achieve success. Thank you. <laughs>